What if I told you there was a single, yet to be identified character from the distant past who holds global significance, and that uncovering this figure is the key to answering all of the biggest questions in One Piece? And surprisingly, I'm not talking about Joy Boy, Sun God Nika, Shirahoshi, Blackbeard, Luffy, Buggy, Shanks, Roger, or any of the other usual suspects. In fact, this incredibly important figure hasn't yet been given a name, but its influence can nevertheless be seen throughout the entire One Piece world. And much like the mythic warrior of liberation, Sun God Nika, has been hiding in plain sight for a very, very long time. What happened in the Void Century? What are the ancient weapons? Who was Joy Boy? What is the One Piece? I'm certainly not the first person to try answering these questions, but this legendary figure may tie everything together. If so, any attempts to unravel the mysteries of the One Piece world may be incomplete without first identifying this key variable. So who or what was this legendary figure? I believe the dragon embodied by Momo and Kaido's devil fruit may be a mythic figure from the distant past, whose influence completely reshaped the One Piece world. We see evidence that this dragon was revered all over the world, extending back through the mists of time which is all the more significant when we consider the Japanese folklore and fairy tales which seemingly served as Oda's inspiration. But it doesn't even stop there, as the mythic fish fruit is tied in some way to numerous key figures. In short, I believe the mythic fish fruit was treasured by the celestial dragons on God Valley, intended for Shanks, targeted by Zebek, defended by Roger and Garp, stolen by Big Mom, eaten by Kaido, replicated by Vegapunk, mimicked by Momonosuke, may be coveted by Blackbeard, and most importantly, embodies the power of the sea itself, particularly the Grand Line, or the Sea Circle, the dominant force in the current epoch of history which guides the world toward freedom, a new dawn brought about by the future Pirate King and the legendary treasure One Piece, hidden at the end of the sea. Before we can untangle the web of mysteries surrounding the mythic sea dragon itself and the role it played in One Piece world history, let's start by examining what we've already learned through Kaido and Momo channeling the power of the mythical fish fruit which seemingly embodies this legendary being. Kaido's own fruit was first revealed in the opening act of Wano, as he transformed into a massive dragon looming over the desolate wasteland of Kuri. Soon after, Luffy rushed to face Kaido and suffered a crushing defeat, landing him in Udon prison for the majority of Wano Act 2. We then learned in chapter 999 that rather than a mythical dragon fruit, Kaido possesses a mythical fish fruit. Although this initially came as a shock, it also makes perfect sense. I didn't personally catch the fish connection before it was revealed, but the clues were already there for readers more well versed in the Japanese language as well as Japanese folklore and mythology. There is a Japanese folktale of a koi or carp fish which swims upstream and against all odds passes through the dragon gate. The fish is thus rewarded by the gods for its perseverance and transformed into a dragon. When the Straw Hats first arrived on Wano, they were greeted by a school of giant koi fish swimming up the waterfalls surrounding the island, referencing the Dragon Gate myth. And Kaido's mustache in both ogre and dragon form closely resembles the facial structure of a koi. Uo Uo, the name of Kaido's fruit, is also contained in the Japanese characters for his distinctive laugh pattern. Close your mouth, sweetie. You look like a trout. The fish fruit model Azur Dragon belongs to the mythical zone category, and accordingly confers its wielder a wide range of powers. Not only can Kaido and Momo transform into massive dragons, they're also capable of flight using flame clouds, breathing fire, and summoning storms. Oda is clearly drawing on real-world myths and folklore in both the fruit's nomenclature as well as the range of abilities granted to its wielder. Luffy's Nika Fruit Awakening has shed light on numerous details regarding devil fruit of the mythical zone variety. Notably, we now know Luffy's fruit derives its name from a legendary being within the One Piece world. The Sun God Nika is said to be a warrior deity of liberation, fabled to set free those in captivity. Whether or not Nika ever really existed, and the nature of Joy Boy and Nika's relationship are topics I'll return to later. But we can now look back and see the clues presented to us from very early on, which hinted at the true nature of Luffy's power and toward the existence of this supposed solar deity. In similar fashion, it would seem the mythic dragon may be revered the world over, particularly by those who were once closest to Joy Boy. In fact, we have very strong evidence indicating that this is in fact the case. In Chapter 921, Kiku described Kato as Wano's guardian deity. During the annual fire festival, Orochi and his envoy travel to Onigashima to offer tribute to the one regarded as Wano's protector. It's important to note that within the land of Wano, Kaido's presence doesn't undermine Orochi's authority, 
While it's clear to readers and outsiders in the world of One Piece that Orochi is nothing but a figurehead shogun, in the minds of Wano citizens, Kaido occupies a position of divine protector, separate from Orochi's position of political authority. But why is this the case, and when did the practice of Wano's political leader paying tribute to a divine protector begin? Has this always been a facet of the Fire Festival, and if so, to which guardian deity was the tribute offered prior to Kaido's incursion, and why is Kaido now regarded as possessing such divinity? We know certain creatures are revered on Wano, such as the Okuchi no Mikami. Additionally, in Chapter 998, Yamato told Momo that the dragon statue kept in the storage room once adorned the entrance to Onigashima. It was damaged by Ace several years ago, but notably the dragon statue doesn't resemble Kaido. Because of Kaido's apparent Oni heritage, he has an extra set of horns. The dragon statue, which once guarded Onigashima's entrance, resembles Momonosuke's dragon form much more so than it does Kaido's, which indicates it likely was not commissioned to resemble Kaido's likeness. This indicates that the mythic dragon was revered on Wano long before Kaido's arrival. In fact, Kaido was regarded as Wano's guardian deity specifically because he represented this dragon. Fittingly, Luffy later told Vegapunk that Momo is now regarded as Wano's guardian deity, likely because he now resembles this mythic dragon. Consistent with the reverence shown for this legendary dragon figure on Wano, the mythical fish fruit which invigorates its power has been highly coveted. In my very first video on this channel, I suggested that Kaido's devil fruit was so special because it was responsible for his immunity to death by way of incredibly good fortune, commonly associated with eastern dragons in mythology. This theory seemed to be fairly robust. As I suspected, airtight. The narration boxes subtly shifted from describing known truths about Kato's past, his previous defeats and captures, and the many failed execution attempts, to the resultant folklore within the One Piece world. Kaido is said to be the world's strongest, but the narrator never explicitly confirmed the veracity of these beliefs. Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, always bet on Kaido. The use of the term bet fit the consistent gambling motif associated with Kaido and his subordinates. We saw misfortune intervene in both Kaido's fights against Odin and Luffy. Even his failed attempts to end his own life were framed as Kaido being yet another warrior incapable of defeating Kaido. Okay, with all due respect to everyone here, I think the most worthy opponent of you is you. That is correct. Unless there happen to be measles present. Kaido's defeat in chapter 1049 would seemingly cast doubt on this theory, but ultimately the mythical fish fruit remains shrouded in mystery. Certainly Kaido proved himself to be powerful enough not to require any good luck stat boost. We don't need luck. But ultimately, I'm still not sure his immunity to death has been fully explained at this point. I'm a man who can never die. Momonosuke, heir to the Kozuki clan, happens to possess an artificial mythical zone fruit which allows him to transform into a dragon much like Kaido. The similarity between Momo and Kaido's abilities goes beyond their physical attributes, with Momo demonstrating several of the same abilities including flight using flame clouds. In fact, we were first introduced to Momo in his dragon form when Luffy found him at the bottom of a garbage chute on Punk Hazard. During the Punk Hazard arc, we learn that unlike the smile fruit used to power Kaido's army, the artificial zone fruit in Momo's possession was created directly by Dr. Vegapunk. In Chapter 1007, the apparent leader of CP0, the world government's elite intelligence agency, discussed the origin of Momo's devil fruit with his subordinates, revealing it is no small coincidence Momo's transformation bears such a striking resemblance to Kaido's given that Dr. Vegapunk created this special artificial zone by extracting Kaido's lineage factor. Essentially, Vegapunk used Kaido's genetic material, extracted while Kaido was in captivity, to synthesize this artificial fruit which was for some reason deemed a failure and left behind on Punk Hazard with Caesar after Vegapunk evacuated. The mystery of Kaido's devil fruit has become an increasingly complex web, but to understand the narrative significance and potential implications of this scene, it's important to remember the role CP0 play in the world of One Piece. Aegis Zero worked directly for the Celestial Dragons, and strive to protect or shield their interests around the world. Much like the cue to their bond, Dr. Vegapunk, head of the SSG, supplies CP0 and the Marines with technologically advanced weapons such as the Pacifista, as well as devil fruit infused objects. This means CP0's interest in the artificial dragon fruit must in some way serve the interests of the celestial dragons. As we have already discussed, Kaido has been defeated and captured many times, but what's notable here is the degree to which Kaido was experimented on while in marine custody, and the lengths to which Vegapunk went to replicate his devil fruit power. We have seen many powerful Devil Fruit users like Crocodile, Ivankov, and Doflamingo sent directly to Impel Down without the government taking such extreme measures to seize their powers. 
Further, it seems they hadn't made any effort to extract or made provisions to capture the devil fruit of even such powerful pirates as Ace and Whitebeard during the Battle of Marineford. Seizing powerful devil fruit from captives and adversaries is not standard operating procedure for the Marines as far as we have seen. On this basis, we can confidently say Kaido was not randomly selected for these particular experiments by Dr. Vegapunk. So then what makes Kaido and his mythical fish fruit so special? We know particular devil fruit like Law's op, op fruit and Blackbeard's Darkness Logia are highly coveted because of the innate powers they bestow upon their wielders. This suggests the world government has particular interest in possessing Kaido's devil fruit because of the unique powers it imparts to the one who eats it, and while transforming into a massive dragon and breathing fire certainly makes Kaido a force to be reckoned with, the very fact that he was defeated and captured in order for these experiments to take place suggests raw power alone does not sufficiently explain the value of Kaido's devil fruit and the corresponding interest demonstrated by the world government in possessing its power. The other question we must ask is why the world government resorted to such extreme measures to take Kaido's ability. When a devil fruit user dies, the soul or essence of the devil fruit is transferred to another fruit of the same type someplace in the world. While the precise mechanics of this transfer of power have not yet been explained, we did directly witness the devil fruit used to create Shinokuni, Land of the Dead, regrow following its death. The fact that Caesar, who worked as an assistant under the world's foremost devil fruit researcher Dr. Vegapunk, was able to anticipate and control the manner in which the devil fruit regrew suggests Vegapunk himself would be fully capable of capturing Kato's devil fruit the natural way if it were possible. Thus, the fact that the government did not simply kill Kaido to take control of his devil fruit speaks volumes, and is likely not for lack of trying. The narration boxes accompanying Kaido's introduction describe 40 failed attempts at capital punishment, almost all of which were likely carried out by the Marines or world government. Notably, Smile Fruit have an ordinary stem and a circular rather than spiral pattern on their surface. Vegapunk labeled the artificial duplicate of Kaido's fruit a failure, yet thus far it appears to be much more effective than Smile in recreating real devil fruit abilities. Notably, we see that though it features the same circle pattern as Smile, Vegapunk's artificial dragon fruit features a spiral stem. This speaks again to the fact that the spiral pattern is related to the functionality and potentially the soul contained within the devil fruit. This is even more interesting in light of the design of Kaido's mythical fish model Azur Dragon Fruit revealed in One Piece Magazine 13. The mythical fish fruit features not one, but two spiral stems. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. One blue and one pink, which is completely unique among devil fruit designs revealed thus far. It's the only fruit to feature more than one stem. So could this mean Kaido's fruit originally contained not one, but two souls? Perhaps this explains the twin dragons in One Piece. In Chapter 1007, the leader of CP0 said the world government pressured Vegapunk to hand over the artificial fish model Azur Dragon Fruit. Vegapunk instead declared the fruit to be a failed experiment and left it behind on Punk Hazard, where it was later discovered and eaten by Momonosuke. None of this strikes me as coincidental. Momonosuke, Kanemon, Kiku, Kanjiro, and Raizo jumped forward in time 20 years, immediately following the death of Momo's father, Kozuki Odin, at the hands of Kaido. Kanemon and Momo then set out to sea in search of allies and arrived on Punk Hazard, where Momo just so happened to find an artificial devil fruit made from the very person responsible for the death of his parents and the decimation of his homeland. Vegapunk later confirmed that Momo's duplicate of Kaido's power is fully functional. He only deemed it a failure because of its pink color. While Vegapunk's perfectionism is played as a joke in this scene, conspicuously he also mentions that he was unable to confirm if the fruit was capable of awakening. This further calls attention to the fact that Kaido himself had not awakened this fruit's power. As I've detailed in previous videos, I believe this is setting up a future conflict in the land of Wano between Momo and Kaido, in which Momo will be the one to truly awaken the power of the mythic sea dragon. Devil fruit are regarded as unnatural forces which transform objective reality through the imaginative power of the subjective individual, abhorred by the sea or mother of nature. But what can then be said of a devil fruit which embodies or invigorates the power of the sea itself, or herself? While awakened Luchi's teeth seem to match the change in Kaido's facial structure toward the end of the rooftop battle, he lacks the collar of billowing flames possessed by Luffy, Luchi, and Yamato. More significantly, devil fruit, particularly of the zone variety, have a powerful will of their own, and thus seem to choose their wielders. It was no small coincidence Luffy awakened Nika while fighting as a warrior of liberation. It thus would seem Kaido didn't awaken because his own will so starkly contrasts with that of the mythic fish fruit. He was either unwilling to lose his own consciousness or entirely incapable of drawing out the mythic dragon, representing the power of the sea itself, a divine protector deeply connected to the land of samurai. 
Kaido's own desire to achieve a warrior's death may run contrary to the fruit's will to keep him alive, if there's any validity to my good fortune theory. But on a more primary level, the sea is the power which guides the world toward freedom, and thus it may be more fitting if its power is fully awakened by Wano's new guardian deity, Momo. If not Luffy, then perhaps Momo is the monarch from a distant sea who will someday meet with Shirohoshi when the promised day arrives. While Luffy and Joy Boy, channeling the power of Nika, stretch smiles across people's faces and bring hope to those living in captivity, the sea truly represents the limitless power of imagination. There's no telling what lies on the infinite horizon. It may also represent the supernatural power of nature, or even metaphorically, the divine source of everything, which creates and sustains life itself. It's a metaphor. I get it. The hierarchy of which power is the most special isn't really relevant, but the fact that the sea itself may be embodied by a devil fruit power could suggest that those who dream of transforming the world may be able to atone for their sin of eating the devil fruit. The egghead story arc may be exploring technology's capacity to transform the world for either the better or the worse, and similarly dreams and strength of will may also be used to do either good or evil. Ultimately, neither Joy Boy nor Roger was able to successfully transform the world. The new worlds envisioned by pirates wearing the mask of the shadow, Kaido, Big Mom, and Teach, would be fundamentally corrupted by their errant worldviews. But even those with noble aspirations like Vegapunk and Dragon, who will likely play an important role, are ultimately not fit to lead this global revolution. Luffy's insistence that he doesn't want to be championed as a hero is the very reason he's so uniquely qualified to become the next Pirate King, and perhaps going beyond Roger and even Joy Boy, Luffy will be able to restore harmony between the cursed dreamers of the day who consume the Devil Fruit and the power of the sea itself, the ruler of the One Piece world. Vegapunk says all things are born into the world with hope, including the Devil Fruit. This suggests that whether by divine or natural process, much like the dreams they invigorate, the Devil Fruit exists for a purpose and were birthed with noble intention. Vegapunk's theory, while compelling, almost certainly doesn't tell us the full story. These powers perceived to be unnatural may have in fact originated from a divine source, but were stolen or corrupted. It's interesting that the phrase all things matches the mysterious voice of all things, which thus far can only be heard by Luffy, Roger, Odin, and Momo, an ability even less common than one in a million conquerors hockey. It would seem then that the supernatural, divine hand of fate delivered the dreams of Nika and the mythic sea dragon to Luffy and Momo respectively. While Pedro told Carrot that Luffy would fulfill the world's long-held prophecies of liberation, Yamato said it would be Momo to deliver the new dawn. Perhaps then Luffy and Momo represent two sides of the same coin, the sun and the sea. These distilled or manifest dreams can be powerful forces for good when paired with the right person, and the divine powers which be have selected Momo and Luffy as the fated mortal heroes needed to resolve this millennia-old conflict and deliver the world's new dawn. While we may learn some more details about the Devil Fruit through a potential Mads flashback, it seems Vegapunk is still missing some key information, which can presumably only be learned through the true history found on Laugh Tale. Perhaps unlocking the secrets of the ancient world's advanced technology and discovering the Undying Flame will be the key to restoring harmony between Devil Fruit users and the power of the sea or the mother of nature thereby allowing Luffy and Momo to fulfill their fated purposes, channeling the powers of Nika and the Mythic Dragon respectively, and the coming war to deliver the world's new dawn. While the particular advantages in combat offered by the mythical dragon fruit are significant, it's possible the government's interest in this particular devil fruit may be even deeper. In Chapter 999, Big Mom said she gifted Kaido his mythical fish zone fruit on the day the Rock's pirates collapsed following the defeat of their captain, Rox D. Zebek, at the hands of Goldie Roger and Monkey D. Garp on God Valley. Perhaps the mythical fish, dragon fruit, was a sacred treasure closely guarded by the celestial dragons on God Valley. It's presently unknown why Rox targeted the celestial dragons on God Valley rather than those in the holy land of Marijua, but it may naturally be assumed someone or something of particular importance to Zebek's goal of becoming world king was located on that particular island. Seeking a particular devil fruit to achieve an intended goal is not without precedent in One Piece. Doflamingo went to great lengths to acquire Law's op, op fruit as he believes it's the key to harnessing the power of the yet-to-be-identified secret treasure held by the Sluster Dragons in Marijua. Similarly, Blackbeard committed the unforgivable sin of killing his crewmate Thatch to possess the Darkness Logia, an act which set in motion the chain of events leading to the deaths of Ace and Whitebeard at Marineford, and the tumultuous two years those events precipitated. 
As noted, Vegapunk and the world government took extreme measures to claim or reclaim this power from Kaido. It's not unreasonable to believe the world nobles would have particularly coveted a devil fruit which allows its user to transform into a dragon given their apparent preoccupation with these mythical creatures. In fact, we know Vegapunk has been conducting experiments to recreate real dragons at the behest of the world nobles, and the very fact that they call themselves celestial dragons implies the nobles highly regard dragons for some reason. Given that the One Piece world is home to all sorts of creatures considered to be myths or legends in our own world, the fact that dragons are specified as one variety believed to be extinct indicates these scaled fire-breathing beasts are in some way narratively significant and played an important, yet to be fully explained role in One Piece world history. Because maps used to say there'd be dragons here, now they don't. So extrapolating on this point, perhaps the mythical fish model Azor dragon fruit was passed down through successive generations among the celestial dragons living on God Valley. This wouldn't be the first time in the series we have seen a zone fruit being passed down within a society in which the particular variety of creature its wielder transforms into is revered or worshipped. For example, taking inspiration from ancient Egypt, within Alabasta the hawk and jackal are deified, and accordingly the two leading military commanders of the Alabasta royal army, Pell and Chaka, possess hawk and jackal zone fruit respectively. Accordingly, it stands to reason these fruits have been passed down within Alabasta for a long time. If we consider the possibility Zebek was targeting God Valley to take the mythical fish dragon fruit for himself, several important questions must then be asked. Was this devil fruit simply guarded as an uneaten treasure on God Valley, or was it previously wielded by one of the celestial dragons? Perhaps much like Pell and Chaka's fruits on Alabasta, the celestial dragons maintain the mythical fish dragon fruit within a line of guardians, or even a particularly elite lineage of nobles. Kings among kings, so to speak. After all, Zebek's goal was to ascend to the role of world king, and it's here worth mentioning, Zebek may not have known about Lord Emu. Accordingly, he may have believed possessing the dragon fruit would have been symbolically important to ruling over the world and its nobility in addition to the functional advantages this fruit confers its wielder in combat. We know that the five elders who currently preside as the outward facing leaders of the world government are themselves celestial dragons, and thus belong to five of the 19 noble families from which the celestial dragons descended. It thus would make sense for certain families to hold positions of greater authority or esteem within the ranks of the world's nobility. If indeed the mythical fish dragon fruit was once in their possession, it would further make sense this fruit previously belonged to a family of greater importance given the esteem with which the nobles regard dragons in general. Big Mom said Kaido owes her a lifelong debt for giving him the mythical fish model Azor dragon fruit on God Valley, which indicates she too is aware of its extraordinary value. This further reinforces the notion that Rock sought out this power for himself in the raid on God Valley. In Chapter 957, Sengoku told Sakazuki and the Marines that Roger and Garp united to defend the Celestial Dragons on God Valley from Rock's assault, but he stopped short of saying they prevented casualties. Following the incident on God Valley 38 years ago, the island has seemingly vanished, wiped from the face of the earth. Could the death of a celestial dragon, particularly one of particular importance to the world government, have prompted this erasure? So essentially, based on what we've already learned about the mythical fish fruit, we know that the dragon on which it's based was revered on Wano long before Kaido's arrival. We further know that the fruit was somehow tied to the God Valley Instant and that the world government has displayed a strong interest in recovering or replicating its power. Unable to kill Kaido, its present wielder, they poured a tremendous amount of resources into funding Vegapunk's work to create an artificial duplicate. But to really understand exactly why this mythical dragon is so revered, we first need to establish a few key details about both the timeline and structure of the One Piece world, through which we begin to form a picture that this dragon embodies the power of the sea itself. There is a fairly common theory that the Red Line was constructed during the Void Century, which concluded with the ascension of the Twenty Kings and their families. The primary basis for this theory is Orr's epithet, Continent Puller, which suggests he and his people may have once had a hand in moving landmasses. The Red Line appears to be aberrant in the world of One Piece, and its association with the world government, formed 800 years ago by the Twenty Kings, makes the Red Line seem like a likely candidate for a continent once pulled by so-called Continent Pullers. To further evidence this theory, Pangaea Castle, which resides in the Holy City, derives its name from the real-world supercontinent, which broke apart approximately 175 million years ago. The same symbol can be seen inside Emu's vault and on Ur's clothing, providing evidence the two are somehow linked. The red line does indeed appear to be an aberration in the world of One Piece, which lends weight to the idea that it was artificially constructed. It's an amalgam of numerous distinct microclimates, suggesting it could have been pieced together. 
Importantly, it seems the wildlife in the world of One Piece are not evolved to coexist with the Red Wall. When the Straw Hat Pirates first entered the Grand Line, they encountered Laboon, an island whale separated from his family by the impenetrable Red Line. Laboon's nose is draped in scars from continually ramming against the globe-spanning supercontinent. This behavior was seemingly explained by the promise made to Laboon by Brooke's crew, the Rumba Pirates. But much later, when the Straw Hats first arrived in the New World, they were accompanied by a gam of island whales, all of which featured the same scars as Laboon, indicating this behavior is common to Laboon species, as if it were instinctive that the Red Line should not be in the way of their natural migration patterns. We can further look at the geographic positioning of the Red Line, which runs orthogonally to the Grand Line, the Sea of Dreams, which protects One Piece and the true history, suggesting they serve opposite purposes. Certainly, a massive 10 kilometer tall wall of Earth separating the world's seas and restricting travel serves the interests of a world government intent on oppressing people's freedom and upholding the authoritarian rulership of corrupt nobles. In fact, the first time the Red Line and Grand Line were explained by Nami in Chapter 23, the Red Line was depicted as a wall separating the world's two oceans, and just recently, Marco referred to the Red Line as the Red Wall. The connotation of the visuals and terminology associated with this landmass are clear and indicate its ultimate intended purpose. Building further on this theory, the land of Wano is unique in that much like the Red Line, it features numerous distinct microclimate zones. Thus, the skull of Onigashima, matching the shape of the so-called continent pullers on a much larger scale, lends even more weight to the idea that the ancient giants were involved in constructing certain geographic features of the One Piece world, including potentially the Red Line and Wano. However, we can now say with certainty that the Red Line predates the reign of the Celestial Dragons, which seemingly dispels any notion that the Twenty Kings were responsible for the construction of the Red Wall. The Lunarians are said to have been the prior inhabitants of this massive supercontinent, which encircles the One Piece world. Importantly, Queen told Sanji the downfall of the Lunarians is recorded in history, and Big Mom seems to be fully aware of the race to which King belongs. Legends of the Lunarians living atop the Red Line also persists as we know from Marco's memories of Whitebeard. This means the history of the Lunarians may not be common knowledge, but records of their powers and their demise remain accessible, unlike the tale of the Forgotten Kingdom recorded solely on the Poneglyphs. Thus, we can confidently say the Lunarians were not the ones wiped out by the Twenty Kings during their rise to power. And by extension, we can confidently say that the Red Line itself has existed since ancient times. If indeed it was constructed to restrict the world's freedom, this leads us to the conclusion that there must have been an evil, oppressive force at work long before the world government. Oda has rarely provided the specific calendar date for events in One Piece, which makes the few instances where he has done so particularly noteworthy. Most events in the One Piece world are only given relative dates. Oda tells us through text box how many years before the ongoing narrative of flashback scene takes place, which allows us to construct a rough timeline of events. The first time an actual calendar year is mentioned is in Chapter 203. During the Alabasta story arc, Robin descended with Crocodile into the royal crypts in search of the Poneglyph said to reveal the location of the ancient weapon Pluton. Though she indeed found a Poneglyph, she told Crocodile it recorded only the history of the Nation of Sand. We later learned in Chapter 218 that Robin was lying to Crocodile as Cobra confirmed the Poneglyph revealed everything Crocodile wanted to know about Pluton, including its location. Importantly, as part of her deception, Robin read Crocodile a sample of Alabasta's history and indicated the calendar date for particular events which took place in the Age of Heaven, or Tenreki. The next time a specific calendar date was mentioned and the only time a definitive year was stated for events actually depicted on panel came from the log of Nolan's voyage to the Kingdom of Shandora. Nolan's flashback was set 400 years before the current events in One Piece, and Nolan dated his arrival on Jaya in the year 1122 in the Age of the Sea Circle, or Kayan Reki. His voyage began in the year 1120 and ended in 1127. Also worthy of note, the day and month divisions in the Sea Circle calendar seem to match our real-world Gregorian calendar. From this information, we can extrapolate several important details. First, through the dates listed by Robin, as well as those recorded by Noland, we know that two distinct calendar systems are used in the One Piece world, much like our own. The current epoch is referred to as the Age of the Sea Circle, or Kayan Reki, which began roughly 1500 years before the present point in time. From this, we can date certain key events, including the construction of Shandora in the year 400, Zunisha's Curse in the year 500, the start of the Void Century in the year 600, the end of the Void Century, and the ascension of the Celestial Dragons in the year 700, Nolan's voyage between the years 1120 and 1127, and the current Great Era of Piracy, which takes place in the 1500s Kayan Reki. 
Also worth noting, Roger indicated Joy Boy left behind One Piece on Laugh Tale 800 years ago, which coincides with the end of the Void Century in the year 700 in the Age of the Sea Circle. We can thus assume the Age of Heaven or Tenreki precedes the current epoch, and likely ended about 1500 years before the present story of One Piece. We don't actually know if the Age of Heaven directly precedes the Age of the Sea Circle, but given there are only two calendar systems referenced thus far, I think it's a safe assumption. Very little has been revealed about the previous era, but we do know Alabasta was already a thriving kingdom during the Age of Heaven, as the palace in Alubarna was said to have been constructed 4,000 years before the present. This means Luffy's voyage is taking place around the year 1520 Age of the Sea Circle or Kayanreki. The Void Century began around 900 years ago and ended 800 years ago, which means the current One Piece world calendar began about 600 years before the Void Century. Yet we know recorded history in the One Piece world dates back at least as far as 5,000 years when the Tree of Knowledge on Ohara was said to have been planted. The world nobles have positioned themselves as false gods, and centered the world around the formation of the world government. They even erased 100 years of history to mask the means by which the 20 kings rose to power, and as Clover asserted, to hide the existence of the Forgotten Kingdom, which once possessed the ancient weapons. Beyond the fact that the Celestial Dragon's own sense of self-importance would be compelling enough reason to restart the calendar year to mark their ascension to so-called godhood, the best way to erase the Void Century would have been to restart the calendars and declare the end of the Hundred Year Void to be the new Year Zero, so as to communicate nothing before this matters, and to further discourage inquiry into events they want to be forgotten. Leaving the calendars as is, and voiding a century in the middle of the timeline, is far more conspicuous. And as far as we know, they have no discernible motive to not restart the calendars with the formation of the world government marking year zero, unless they know the world wouldn't recognize that change, because something undeniably more important happened in year zero. This further suggests the Celestial Dragons also recognize this theoretical event as somehow more important than themselves and the formation of the world government. They maintain the calendar system because they too regard the reason for the epochal shift marked by the transition from the Age of Heaven to the Age of the Sea Circle to be important and worth not only remembering, but memorializing. The calendar system currently used is Kayan Reki, or in the Viz translation, the Age of Kayan. This roughly translates to the Age of the Sea Circle, which immediately brings to mind the Grand Line, the sea which encircles the globe and leads to One Piece. This perhaps suggests the Grand Line came into being 1500 years before the story began. The prior epoch is referred to as Tenreki, or the Age of Heaven, which certainly matches the described time period in which a land of gods once occupied the top of the Red Wall. The end of the Age of Heaven would thus fittingly describe the fall of these so-called gods. I think we can thus begin to form a picture of the major events which mark the epochal shift from the Age of Heaven to the Age of the Sea Circle the fall of the Lunarians and the destruction of the Land of Gods at the end of the Age of Heaven, and the formation of the Grand Line, the birth of the Sea Circle, which provided the name for the world's current epoch. Above all else, I believe what the change in calendar system indicates is that though the world government is the dominant political body, the ocean itself is presently viewed as the true ruler of the One Piece world, and thus Emu's task in subjugating people's freedom remains incomplete. One last point worth remembering in understanding these two systems of dating is Oda's frame of reference. In the real world, the dating system spread throughout Europe by Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Empire and later exported to other parts of the world during the colonial era splits recorded history into two distinct epochs, with the birth of Christ marking year zero. Importantly, though the year numbering system based on BC and AD is used ubiquitously throughout the world due to global communication and commerce, countries which historically weren't directly influenced by Rome may also use their own dating systems. Japan uses the Gregorian calendar with year designations noting the year of the reign of the current emperor. Thus, the dating conventions of Tenreki and Kayanreki may be more directly based on the imperial dating system used in Japan. All of this is to say you could also think of these two calendar systems as indicating the reign of heaven and the reign of the sea circle. Thus, while I believe a pivotal event occurred to mark this apocal transition for the reasons previously noted, I think the people within the One Piece world recognize what is viewed as the dominant or ruling force with the calendar system used, just as those living in Japan date the calendar year based on the year in the reign of a particular emperor. Therefore, the term Tenreki indicates the reign of heaven, which fittingly describes the time period in which the Lunarians inhabited their so-called land of gods atop the Red Wall. 
The term Kayanreki, where the age of the sea circle, not only tells us when the Grand Line was created, it also indicates that the sea circle is presently viewed as the dominant or ruling force within the One Piece world, even by the world government, quite fitting for a seafaring adventure story. Now importantly, if the Red Line represents oppression and division, and the sea itself represents freedom, then the Grand Line, created by the power of the sea, is the ultimate expression of freedom in the One Piece world. What's becoming clear is that while the true history holds the key to understanding exactly what happened during the Void Century, which took place between the years 600 to 700 in the Age of the Sea Circle, the conflict in the One Piece world likely began much earlier. Sunisha was cursed 1,000 years ago, Ryugu Kingdom was already forcibly located at the bottom of the sea during the Void Century, and the fact that Nika was famous for liberating slaves means the world wasn't in some type of idyllic utopian state before the rise of the Twenty Kings and world government. By identifying this apocal shift, it becomes clear that our story actually begins during the prior Age of Heaven, more than 1500 years before Luffy set sail, during which the epic struggle between the forces of freedom and oppression truly began. I presented evidence which suggests the Red Line was constructed during the Age of Heaven, potentially through the combined efforts of the Lunarians and Or's much larger ancestors based on shared ideology and iconography. Even if this turns out to be the case, we're likely still missing a key piece of information, because constructing a globe-spanning, 10-kilometer tall wall of solid rock would be unimaginably time and energy intensive, no matter how large Or's ancestors might have been, and thus likely involved some supernatural process or force. Yet I believe much like the modern celestial dragons, these primordial oppressors serve the interests of the true devil who now occupies the empty throne. It may be notable that the Red Line rises 10 kilometers above the ocean surface. Given the delusional sense of divinity possessed by its inhabitants past and present, perhaps this represents an attempt to reach the heavens so to speak, alluding to the mythic Tower of Babel, an effort by mortal beings to achieve divinity. As Bruce Springsteen sings in the song Badlands, poor men want to be rich, rich men want to be kings, and kings aren't satisfied until they rule everything. If Emu is an enemy of freedom, and thus the sea itself, perhaps the reason he resides atop the Red Wall is to remain far removed from its influence. Devil Fruit users are cursed by the sea, and perhaps so too is Emu. It would make sense to remain as far as possible from his greatest weakness. This could even explain Tequila Wolf's construction. If Emu can't set sail, then perhaps this massive bridge is meant to bring him to some unknown destination across the sea. The story of One Piece is ultimately about the pursuit of freedom. As Luffy stated on Sabaudi in Chapter 507, he wants to become the Pirate King in order to maximize personal freedom. We can thus intuit that the antagonistic force in the story, this primordial evil which initiated the overarching conflict and serves as Luffy's thematic antithesis, represents an inversion of this ideal, oppressing and restriction of freedom. I believe we see this thematic struggle between freedom and oppression represented in the world's geography. After all, the Red Line isn't the only globe-spanning geographic superstructure. The Red Line and Grand Line are positioned orthogonally and serve counter-purposes. The sea in One Piece represents the ability to pursue freedom. Before the Red Line was constructed, people from all over the world would have been able to freely sail the world's seas. The ocean is the connective tissue which binds together the world's people and the geographically distinct islands they inhabit. Conversely, the Red Line restricts travel to certain defined and controlled routes, and those which aren't directly under the government's control are extraordinarily dangerous. I believe the evidence suggests the Red Line came into being before the Grand Line, which then means the latter was created in response to the former. The Red Line was created first, likely during this Age of Heaven. This is important as it tells us that though the world government later rose to power during the Void Century, there has been an evil oppressive force in the One Piece world for more than 1500 years. So to summarize, at some indefinite point in the past, dark forces converged to construct the Red Line. Then 1500 years ago, the Grand Line came into being as a counterbalancing force for good. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the of evil. The Grand Line, which I assume to be the Sea Circle for which the current calendar system is named, is the Sea of Dreams hemmed in by the Calm Belts, which are home to the Sea Kings, ancient sentient beings who also await the promised future day when One Piece is rediscovered. I asserted that the Grand Line, much like the Red Line, was intentionally created to serve a purpose. But why, how, and by whom? You may be familiar with the design principle, form follows function, and indeed, the particular form of the Grand Line is remarkable. The Grand Line seems to be a gauntlet intentionally designed to test adventurers' strength and their ability to form bonds of fellowship with many people across the sea in pursuit of the final island. The purpose of this filtering system seems to be intrinsically linked with the treasure hidden on Laugh Tale. 
In Chapter 966, Roger confirmed the legend of the treasure at the end of the Grand Line which spurred his voyage already existed from long ago. Thus, the legend of the treasure and the government's desire to prevent it from being discovered predate Roger's successful circumnavigation of the globe, his coronation as Pirate King, the name One Piece, Roger's execution, and the current great era of piracy. In Chapter 967, Roger confirmed Joy Boy was the last person to have visited Laugh Tale 800 years earlier, which suggests One Piece was left behind at the very end of the Void Century. As indicated by the various prophecies of Joy Boy's return and the approaching New Dawn, rediscovery of this ancient treasure will mark another epochal shift in the One Piece world. But importantly, the nomenclature of the world's calendar system indicates the Grand Line's formation, and thus its purpose, if its construction was indeed intentional, is rooted in an event even earlier than the Void Century. Essentially, we know the Red Line existed prior to the Void Century based on the fact that the Lunarians preceded Marie Joie and the name of the prior epoch suggests it has existed for more than 1500 years. The Lunarians and the Land of Gods likely inhabited the Red Wall during the Age of Heaven. Although the Twenty Kings had no hand in its formation, there is still strong indication the Red Line is artificial because it acts as a wall separating the world seas, restricting freedom. I believe the fact that the Grand Line is bordered and protected by the Sea Kings suggests the world's most famous ocean route was similarly intentionally constructed, and its purpose is to protect the treasure contained on the final island, guiding the world toward freedom. The nomenclature of the current epoch, Kayan Reki, or the Age of the Sea Circle, suggests the Grand Line was originally formed at the start of this current era, and is responsible for its name. One Piece is widely believed to be the key to upending the world government, but the current regime came into power 600 years after the Grand Line's formation, suggesting this ocean route already had a purpose in protecting the final island before the Void Century. The Grand Line can only be entered through specific defined routes, meaning it must be traveled unidirectionally. Anyone who seeks the end of the line is thus forced to sail across the entire world. This requires a tremendous amount of skill and incredible physical strength to survive such a harrowing voyage. Yet strength alone isn't enough, as the four road poneglyphs are needed to reach the true final island laugh tale. Only by becoming friends with those who guard these red monoliths and the ones capable of translating them can the voyage to the end of the Grand Line be completed. Thus, this filtering system tests the mettle of those who attempt this perilous voyage. The journey itself naturally selects for the qualities requisite of the future Pirate King. Only by possessing physical fortitude, strength of will, and upstanding moral character can Laugh Tale be reached and One Piece be discovered. The form of the Grand Line, as well as its orientation relative to the Red Line, indicate it was designed for a purpose, and we can recognize that purpose during the current great era of piracy and protecting One Piece and the true history until the right person arrives at the right time as people from all over the world set sail in pursuit of Roger's treasure. Yet the Grand Line was formed 600 years before the Void Century, long before Roger and even Joy Boy. Thus, based on its design, it was meant to serve the same purpose before Joy Boy's era. After all, if the reign and fall of the Lunarians took place during the Age of Heaven, the overarching conflict in the One Piece world must have begun much earlier than the Void Century War between the Twenty Kings and the Forgotten Kingdom. This would then mean the Grand Line was meant to guide the world toward freedom long before Joy Boy's era began. The early age of the Sea Circle is fascinating in that we do know some key events which took place during this era. The Kingdom of Shandora was said to be a thriving nation in the year 402 Kyanreki, and the Land of Zo was formed atop Sunisha's back around the year 500 Kyanreki, or 100 years before the start of the Void Century, 200 years before it committed a great crime. These nations, which would later ally with Joy Boy, were prosperous before the cataclysmic war that soon followed, which indicates that despite the continued presence of the Red Line, the world was enjoying a relative degree of peace. Perhaps most importantly, Wano's borders were open, and thus, by extension, so too was the Grand Line. In the 800 years following the end of the Void Century, Wano's borders have been closed to the world, restricting access to its primary natural resource, Sea Stone. In the modern age, the Grand Line can only be entered through Reverse Mountain because its borders are guarded by the Combelts and the Sea Kings. But Sea Stone allows the Combelts to be traversed at any point. This means that in the 600 years preceding the Void Century, Wano's open borders made the Grand Line far more accessible and welcoming to those who pursued freedom. We see here the importance of the Grand Line, which permits entry to anyone seen as an ally of the sea and keeps out enemies of freedom. And it would seem Wano's natural resource is the key. This is the reason the Grand Line remains the world's dominant force, because the ocean is vast and its power cannot be contained, even with a globe-spanning supercontinent parsing its waters in two. But we haven't yet answered the question of who created the Grand Line at the start of the Sea Circle calendar, and I believe this is where our mythic sea dragon enters the picture.
It's difficult to say exactly what it might mean, but there's a striking visual similarity between adult Momo's dragon form and the dragon statue which adorns Ryugu Castle on Fishman Island. Iconography in One Piece is important, and while Oda has often used eastern dragons in his color spreads, he's far more intentional within the narrative itself. Fishman Island is heavily inspired by the Japanese fairy tale Urashima Taro, which tells the story of a fisherman who rescues a sea turtle from a group of children. Taro later learns that this small turtle is in fact Otohime, daughter of the Emperor of the Sea, Ryujin. He is then escorted to the underwater palace Ryugujo, which translates to the Palace of the Dragon God, where he is rewarded for his act of heroism. Taro remains under the sea for three days before returning to the surface. Before Taro departs from Ryugujo, Otohime gives him a mysterious box called the Tamate Bako. Though Taro has only been gone for a short time, he returns home to find three centuries have passed on the surface. With his family and home lost to time, in great distress, Taro opens the Tamate Bako, which produces a cloud of white smoke. The young fisherman, suddenly aged, then hears Otohime's voice cry out from the seafloor, I warned you not to open the box, for inside was your old age. The parallels to the Fisherman Island arc are immediately recognizable, though as discussed earlier, Oda always remixes the legends and folktales he draws on for inspiration. Much like Taro guided to the ocean floor by a large turtle, Luffy was guided to Fishman Island by Megalo, Shirohoshi's pet shark. The daughter of the sea emperor in the story of Urashima Taro served as the namesake for Queen Otohime in One Piece. The Tamate Bako, which also derives its name from the story, existed as a sacred treasure on Fishman Island, and quite similarly, Hody, Vanderdecken, and the rest of the new Fishman pirates were radically aged by consuming its contents. Ryugu Palace in One Piece, home to King Neptune, Shirahoshi, and the rest of the royal family, is named after Ryugu Jo, the underwater palace belonging to Ryujin, the dragon god of the sea and mythical protector of Japan. Now, the part of the story I want to focus on is the dragon god of the sea, Ryujin. While most elements of the tale of Orishima Taro have direct analogs in the story world of One Piece, the ruler of Ryugu Jo in Taro's tale is yet unaccounted for. King Neptune is the current sovereign of Fishman Island. His namesake is Neptune, god of the sea in Roman mythology. But the statue adorning Ryugu Palace, as well as its name, indicate the sea dragon god is somehow involved in this story, which is significant given Fishman Island's importance to the overarching conflict in the One Piece world. The visual similarity between the palace's design and Momonosuke's form further suggests that Ryujin in One Piece is somehow connected to the mythical fish devil fruit. Ryujin protects Japan in myth, and Wano being the One Piece version of Japan suggests further that the mythic fish fruit, or at least the form its wielder takes, somehow links Fishman Island to the land of Wano, which doesn't come as much of a surprise given both nations protected road poneglyphs and were allied in some way with Joy Boy. It's also interesting to note that this same figure can be seen in the baths on Alabasta and in the statue which once adorned the entrance to Onigashima. As noted earlier in the video, the dragon statue on Onigashima doesn't feature Kaido's extra set of horns, indicating it was meant to represent a different mythic dragon figure. Alabasta also protects a poneglyph, further indicating reverence for this figure connects those once allied with Joy Boy. What's most interesting is that this dragon figure appears to be revered in some form by both sides of the conflict which began in the Void Century. The world government has special interest in reacquiring or replicating Kaido's devil fruit, while the dragon form its wielder takes is apparently of great significance to the fishmen and potentially the people of Wano, as well as those on Alabasta, societies we know were once allied with Joy Boy, as they now protect road poneglyphs. We also see a serpentine figure in the hieroglyphs inside the crypts on Alabasta, which almost certainly hint toward the world's lost history. I also wonder if worshipping the giant snake or sea serpent on Jaya could be a distortion of the original practice, especially given that this practice also entailed human sacrifice, which probably wouldn't really resonate with Nika, the warrior of liberation. Based on their shared anatomical structure, I wonder if the snake could be a stand-in for the original sea dragon. I think above all else, what this suggests is that an analog to Ryujin, the mythic dragon god of the sea, must exist or have existed in the One Piece world, and the particular importance of the dragon devil fruit is predicated on its connection to this mythic figure. I wouldn't call this next point evidence as much as it is an interesting observation. Oda commissioned a large dragon statue identical to Momo's dragon form for his home's bathroom, which serves as a faucet for hot water. Oda's home is full of an eclectic mix of pop culture decorations, including a life-size terminator and a shark head above his toilet. But this particular dragon statue could be significant. 
The fact that Oda chose to feature this dragon so prominently in his own home could further indicate the importance of this figure to the One Piece world, as it seems to be incredibly similar to the dragon head faucets from the bath on Alabasta, which I earlier suggested could reference the mythic sea dragon based on Ryujin. It's no secret Oda's career and story have taken inspiration from Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball. While the resemblance between the mythic dragon in One Piece and Shenron may be coincidental since they're both based on the same mythological creature, Oda choosing to feature a mythic dragon in the prominent role I've proposed could be viewed as a fitting homage to one of the series which first inspired Oda to become a manga artist. Kaido's Devil Fruit is named the mythical fish fruit model Azura Dragon. Now it's important to note that the Azura Dragon in Japanese mythology is named Siryu, so it's not synonymous with Ryujin. Siryu, or the Azar Dragon in Japanese mythology, is considered one of the four guardian spirits, or deities, the protector of the east. The Azar Dragon of the east is accompanied by the white tiger of the west, the black tortoise of the north, the vermilion bird of the south, and the yellow dragon of the center. But again, Oda mixes and matches when drawing inspiration from mythology. So while it's true that this dragon figure likely in part takes inspiration from Siryu or the Azar Dragon, its presence atop Ryugu Palace means that it's not wholly drawing from this single myth. It's also taking inspiration from Ryujin, the Japanese dragon god of the sea. What this means is that Oda is combining elements from these two distinct myths to make something wholly unique within the One Piece world. We already know based on its name, the mythical fish model Azor Dragon Fruit, that Kaido's power takes inspiration from the myth of the Dragon Gate. This dragon may also be revered on Elbath, based on the figurehead of the Norse themed ships sailed by the giants. But it's important to note the giants in One Piece take inspiration from real world Norse mythology. Legends of sea serpents or dragons are fairly common all around the world. While the form and meaning of these serpentine symbols varies, the Norse myth of Jormungandr may offer an interesting parallel to Ryujin and Siryu, and thus its role in helping to instigate Ragnarok could have been incorporated into Oda's design for the legendary sea dragon in One Piece. We know that an apocalyptic war is fast approaching to decide the fate of this world of pirates. Odin told Toki that this impending war will be great enough to split the sea itself in two. For reasons I'll soon explore in greater depth, I believe the giants of Elbath likely share the same ancient ties to Joy Boy, the world's former warrior of liberation, and thus likely have a similar prophecy to the Minx, Fishmen, and Kozuki about a future promised day when the world will be restored. I expect the giants, inspired by real world Vikings and Norse mythology, will refer to this impending war as Ragnarok, the war to end all wars. There are many figures ranked among the Norse pantheon foremost of which is the so-called Allfather Odin, mightiest and wisest of the Norse deities and ruler of the land of Asgard. While the deities of Norse mythology engaged in numerous battles against frost giants and all forms of mythical beings, they were even more famously plagued by the misdeeds of one of their own, Loki the god of mischief, a frequent enemy and occasional ally. To make a long story short, among his many exploits, unbeknownst to the other Asir, Loki illegitimately fathered three children. Fenrir the Wolf, Hel the Undead, and Jormungandr the Serpent. Upon their discovery, Odin became fearful of Loki's children, sensing that they were destined to stand as enemies of the gods. Accordingly, he first had Jormungandr the Serpent tossed into the sea. Hel was tricked into presiding over the innoble undead in the underworld, unable to return to the land of the living. And Fenrir, at first a loyal companion, was deceived and bound with an unbreakable thread forged by the dwarves. Thus, Odin's fears were settled, as Loki's three children were, at least for the time being, rendered inert. But that's not where their story ends, as the legend of Ragnarok foretells that someday in the very distant future, Fenrir the Wolf, the Midgard serpent Jormungandr, and Hel, Queen of the Undead, will return in the war to end all wars. Over the millennia, Jormungandr, the serpent, will grow and grow until it becomes large enough to encircle the entire globe. Fenrir will grow strong enough to break free from its chains, with its gaping jaws capable of swallowing up the moon, and Hel will raise up an army of the dead, greater and far more fearsome than any the world has ever seen. The world will enter a long winter as the old gods sleep, only to be awoken by Loki's three children. Odin will call down all the long-dead noble warriors from the halls of Valhalla to combat the forces of destruction, and in the end, both Loki's children and the old gods, including Odin, Thor, Heimdall, and Loki himself, will fall in combat, only for the world to begin anew from the roots of Yggdrasil. Now, this is just a legend, but notably the Battle of Ragnarok in Norse mythology is meant to signify the end of an age and the fall of the old gods, which offers us some interesting insight when mapped to the world of One Piece. 
In the current era, these celestial dragons and Lord Emu reign as false, self-proclaimed gods. While those who carry the name D, their ancient enemies according to Emu, are referred to as the enemies of the gods. Many of Joy Boy's allies from around the world cling to prophecies of a coming new dawn, when the world will be restored and the forces of darkness will be dispelled. There is no night which doesn't end in sunrise. We already know that the giants, just like the minks, fishmen, and kozuki, have a similar prophecy as just like the vikings of old, they celebrate the winter solstice to mark the death and rebirth of the sun, likely referencing the mythical warrior of liberation, sun god Nika. So in that context, the Battle of Ragnarok is unlikely to be fought during the Straw Hat's time on Elbath. Rather, this apocalyptic prophecy will likely be used to foretell the impending dawn. The fall of the old, self-proclaimed gods, the Celestial Dragons, Elder Planets, and Lord Emu, and the creation of a new and better world. Interestingly, we already know there exists a Prince Loki among the giants, and as such, it stands to reason that his children, the other key figures responsible for instigating the final battle foretold in Norse canon, will also appear in some form. Now, Oda never maps his stories one-to-one -one on the mythological and historical accounts he uses for inspiration. So, these characters may appear in different form than one might expect based on Ragnarok. We know, for example, that in the not-so-distant past, Loki was searching for a bride. So, the three principal players in Ragnarok may not be his biological children, but may nevertheless be people or entities whose powers combined are critical in ending Emu's reign of darkness. Now, this is the entire reason I brought up this topic in today's video. In particular, the Midgard or World Serpent Jormungandr could be seen as an analog of sorts to the Japanese sea dragon deity Watatsumi, or Ryujin, already used by Oda to characterize the deep sea currents and seemingly used as the partial inspiration for Kaido and Momo's mythical fish fruit, evidenced by the fact that this legendary serpentine dragon seems to be revered throughout the Grand Line, on islands such as Alabasta, Jaya, Ryugu Kingdom, Wano, and even Elbaf itself. Not only do the giant's ships feature dragon figureheads, resembling the serpentine dragon which adorns Rigu Palace and the Tori Gate outside Onigashima, but we also see a snake-like figure on the Norse-themed shields carried by the Straw Hats in the admittedly non-canon Viking color spread. And even more significantly, Dorian Bragi directly referenced this mythical being in Chapter 129. Using their combined strength to blast away the island swallowing goldfish, they said that the only thing the Spear of Elbaf, referencing Odin's mighty spear, can't pierce, is the great serpent soaked in blood, which as I've asserted, could reference this mythic sea dragon. At the very least, this certainly seems to reference the Midgard serpent based on the giant's Norse inspiration. Certainly, the Grand Line, which protects the One Piece and the ancient weapons, could be viewed as one of the key instruments in the world government and Emu's ultimate destruction fitting as an analog to the World Serpent from the Norse story of Ragnarok. As noted, Ryujin is the deity of the sea in Japanese mythology, said to reside in the underwater palace Ryugujo. According to legend, Ryujin is able to assume human form and represents the power of the ocean. Matching some of the abilities demonstrated by Kaido, Ryujin is able to generate storms, bringing with him rain and thunder. Much like Shirohoshi's power over the Sea Kings, Ryujin is said to command sea creatures to do his bidding, and possesses jewels which allow him to control the tides. As an island nation, Japan historically held particular reverence for the sea, and as such, the ocean deity Ryujin was believed to be a benevolent spirit and guardian. Historically, Ryujin has even been worshipped or revered through a form of Shinto known as Ryujin Shinko. One Piece takes place in a world dominated by oceans, and the power of the sea is a recurrent motif. Oda even used this dragon figure to illustrate the pattern of the deep sea currents, further indicating a connection between this dragon and the power of the sea. This illustration isn't an isolated instance. Robin later described the White Strom or Deep Sea Whirlpool as a massive, live, writhing dragon near the sea floor. We thus see that repeatedly Oda has used this dragon to characterize the sea's currents. Additionally, the three ancient weapons all seem to relate to the power of the sea. Pluton is a massive warship built to ride the waves, while Poseidon is the name assigned to the mermaid capable of issuing commands to the Sea Kings, massive sentient beings which inhabit the calm belts bordering the Grand Line. I believe the weapon Uranus somehow harnesses the power of the moon to control the tides and weather, similar to the jewels possessed by Ryujin. We can thus see that these three ancient weapons may also be tied to this mythic figure Ryujin. Generally speaking, the sea in One Piece is representative of freedom. Ryugu Palace is adorned by a figure resembling Ryujin, and Fishman Island awaits a day when they will be guided to liberation to at last live under the real sun, indicating Ryujin is or was a figure associated with protecting the world's freedom. We also see the same serpentine dragon is used as the figurehead for Dragon's ship, the Wind Granma. This is particularly noteworthy as the revolutionary army is at war with the world government, intent on bringing about the world's liberation. 
the fruit which allows its wielder to assume the form of this legendary dragon is categorized as a mythical fish model, further connecting it to the sea. Yet those who possess devil fruit are also cursed by the power of the sea and are unable to swim. This same energy, described as the power of the sea, is imbued in the mineral sea stone, deposits of which are exclusively found on the island of Wano, the One Piece analog to Japan. Oda may have also used elements of the various myths surrounding Ryujin in constructing the land of Wano itself. Though a mythic guardian deity of the sea, Ryujin's palace is believed to reside at the bottom of Lake Biwa near Kyoto, Japan's ancestral capital. The capital was only moved to Edo, renamed Tokyo, after the Meiji Restoration. Notably, Wano was patterned on feudal-era Japan, a time period when Kyoto still remained the nation's capital. Wano's closed borders created what is essentially a massive freshwater lake surrounding the island, similar to the mythic dragon deity's residence, Lake Biwa. This makes the reference shown for Kaido and Momo predicated on their resembling this mythic dragon all the more significant. Earlier, we discussed the legend of Urashima Taro, but Ryujin is central to numerous Japanese myths, including that of Hori and the Magic Hook. In this tale, Ryujin is also referred to as Wadatsumi, whose name was perhaps not so coincidentally used as the basis for Sun Pirate's fishman Wadatsumi. Hori, the great-grandson of Shinto sun goddess Amaterasu, loses a magic fishing hook at the bottom of the sea. He thus sets out in search of Wadatsumi, or Ryujin, in order to retrieve it from beneath the waves, but in the process, falls in love with the sea dragon's daughter. In myth, Hori and Toyotama Hime's grandchild was believed to be Emperor Jimu, the legendary first emperor of Japan, whose ascension is traditionally dated in myth around the year 660 BC. Japan's emperor was historically regarded as divine, because the imperial family was believed to descend from the sun deity Amaterasu. But Watatsumi, or Ryujin, the deity of the sea, was also regarded as grandfather to the royal family. This has some very interesting implications for Wano and the Kozuki clan, given the prominence of both the legendary sun god Nika and the mythic dragon deity of the sea, whose name in the One Piece world hasn't yet been revealed. Could the birth of the Land of Samurai and its royal lineage be similarly tied to these mythic beings within the One Piece world? Perhaps not just the Kozuki, but also the Amatsuki or Heavenly Moon Clan are directly descended from these legendary beings. It's also worth noting that in Japanese folklore, the time period preceding the ascension of Japan's first mortal emperor Jimu is referred to as the Age of Gods, remarkably similar to the name of the prior epoch in the One Piece world, Tenreki, or the Age of Heaven. I earlier suggested that the Sea Dragon was responsible for the formation of the Grand Line at the start of the Sea Circle calendar, but perhaps there was a similarly important mortal figure on Wano, analogous to Emperor Jimu, who rose to prominence at the start of the current epoch and helped establish Wano's importance in guiding the world toward freedom, representing marriage of the sun and sea. Or maybe this figure, analogous to Emperor Jimu, was translated to Joy Boy, the world's forgotten pirate king who may have first departed from Wano. In any case, it would seem that just like in Japanese myth, the One Piece world's calendars reflect a transition from the reign of divine to mortal beings. And it's no small coincidence that as the One Piece world approaches its new dawn, these legendary entities have re-emerged in some form. It's important to again note that while these parallels are interesting and potentially revelatory, Oda doesn't map his story one-to-one -one on the tales he uses as inspiration. For example, Japan's Shinto creation myth proposes Izanagi gave rise to Amaterasu, Susanoo, and Tsukiyomi, deities of sun, storms, and moon respectively, rulers of the heavens, seas, and night. These symbols indeed appear in One Piece, but are not directly analogous to these mythic beings. Oda seems to blend ideas from various sources of inspiration. So while the devil fruit certainly primarily draw from the biblical story of Eden, Vegapunk's description of devil fruit wielders being restricted to their own dimensions of reality may also in some way reflect the Japanese Shinto myth of Izanagi and Izanami, the latter of whom was confined to Yomi, made one with the land of the dead, after consuming its food. In Japanese Shinto creation myth, the islands of Japan and their guardian Kami originated from Izanagi and Izanami, the latter of whom eventually died and was sent to the land of the dead, or Yomi. Izanagi attempted to retrieve her from Yomi, but as noted, Izanami could no longer return because she had already consumed food of the dead, or Yomi. Izanagi was then frightened by Izanami's monstrous appearance, and thus fled back to the land of the living. Abandoned, Izanami's resultant grudge was believed to originate the cycle of life and death. Izanami pledged to claim 1,000 lives each day, and Izanagi countered that he would birth 1,500 more. Once Izanagi returned to the land of the living, his purification created Amaterasu, Tsukiyomi, and Susanoo. 
Luffy's Nika powers may take some inspiration from Amaterasu, but just as the Azura dragon in One Piece mixes and matches multiple myths, the Sun God seems to draw on numerous sources of inspiration, including Hanuman or San Goku, to create something wholly unique in the One Piece world. Thus, while it may be tempting to compare Blackbeard and his Darkness Logia to Tsukiyomi, the deity of the moon or night, because the world is in a metaphorical state of night, the moon in One Piece has been primarily used as a symbol of hope, representing a reflection of the sun's light and a promise of an eventual new dawn. If Blackbeard indeed draws from Tsukiyomi, this would imply he needs to be redeemed in order to work together with Luffy. Further, based on Shandian legends, Nika seemingly belongs to a quartet rather than a trio. Accordingly, it's likely the dragon deity embodying the power of the sea only in part represents Ryujin, or Wadatsumi. It's interesting, however, that in Japanese myth, the sea deity Ryujin, or Wadatsumi, was the child of Izanagi and Izanami from a time before their primordial schism, meaning Ryujin, or Wadatsumi, precedes Amaterasu. This could potentially relate to devil fruit users being cursed by the sea or mother of nature, perhaps somehow reflective of the myth of Izanami, cursed to reside in the underworld. Ultimately, it's unclear exactly how Oda is going to remix these stories, but some of the parallels are nevertheless interesting to consider, and all of this lends more weight to the idea that the overarching conflict in the One Piece world began long before the Void Century. In order to understand how these legends impact One Piece lore, I think it's important to look at the themes and spirit of these mythic accounts more so than the particular intricacies of the plot and the characters involved. And in this particular case, it seems the Devil Fruit and the curse imparted to their wielders may originate from some type of primordial schism. Whatever or whoever these mythic beings might have been, their influence over the One Piece world was likely greater during the Age of Heaven. Yet the mortal beings who now inhabit the stage have seemingly inherited their will, both metaphorically and quite literally, through the power of the Devil Fruit similar to the archetypal masks outlined by Joseph Campbell in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Perhaps most significantly, as discussed earlier in the video, the current epoch in the One Piece world is Kaien Reki, or the Age of the Sea Circle. The Grand Line, the legendary ocean route of dreams which guards the world's lost history and the legendary treasure One Piece, is the ultimate representation of the sea's power. Understanding the origin and importance of the Grand Line may thus prove critical in discovering the lost sea dragon Ryujin. So, to summarize, while we haven't quite arrived at a decisive conclusion regarding the legendary dragon's identity in the One Piece world, we can surmise that it may be revered throughout the Grand Line by Joy Boy's closest allies, and may even be shown deference by the world's current oppressors, the Celestial Dragons. It would seem reverence for this figure predates the Void Century, evidenced by the name of Ryugu Kingdom and the dragon statue's place of prominence atop the castle. The fact that an identical dragon statue once adorned the Tori Gate at the entrance to Onigishima further indicates that it was similarly revered on Wano. At this point, it's not yet clear why this figure was worshipped, but notably inspired by Shinto tradition and the myth of Ryujin, it would seem this dragon embodies or represents the power of the sea itself, which could be considered the dominant or ruling force in the One Piece world, evidenced by the nomenclature of the world's dating system, Kai and Reki, or the Age of the Sea Circle. But perhaps it's no small coincidence that Kozuki Momonosuke has inherited the power of this legendary dragon before taking his rightful throne as Shogun of Wano, a land deeply connected to Joy Boy and the power of the sea, in which this dragon was regarded as a guardian deity. Luffy's recent awakening allows him to channel the power of the legendary warrior of liberation, Sun God Nika, representing Joy Boy's will. In so doing, he's poised to help realize the unfulfilled will of this fallen hero. Perhaps in similar fashion, Momo, who we know is destined to play an important part in delivering the world's new dawn, will awaken the power of the sea dragon to at last realize its will for the One Piece world. One Piece takes place in a world dominated by oceans, and the power of the sea is a recurrent motif. And here's where I think it's important to remember two things. First, Oda's cultural influence in writing One Piece. Japan is an island nation where all aspects of life are in some way impacted by the sea, and thus this fictional world was designed to be centered around seafaring pirates. Oda is a thoughtful and intentional author, and he's a grand architect when it comes to world building. It then makes sense that the central conflict in the story pits those who live in harmony with the sea against those who attempt to tame or control it. As Luffy said, he doesn't want to conquer or rule anything as the Pirate King, but to live a life of freedom, while those who constructed the Red Line wanted the exact opposite. It's very difficult to say without more information whether Ryujin was a real being or a myth used to characterize the Serpentine Sea Circle, but I lean toward the former. Ryugu Kingdom and Wano would have both played a critical role in facilitating free travel across the world and in gating entry to the Grand Line. 
Fishman Island is the nexus which connects the two halves of the world's ocean, and Wano, itself a massive fountain, could be viewed in some ways as the heart of a society or interconnected web of societies centered around the Grand Line. If this legendary figure could create the Grand Line, or at the very least direct its construction, then why could it not bring down the Red Line? Why are the mortal players involved in this story necessary? The frequency with which this symbol is seen, the particular locations where they are found, its Japanese mythological inspiration, and the symbolic importance of the overarching narrative all come together to tell us this dragon was important, and given the timeline of world events, I think it makes sense that a supernatural being embodying the power of the sea was responsible for creating the conditions which allow the world to move toward freedom, yet Ryujin left the actual task of liberating the world to mortal beings. It's very common in epic fantasy stories that supernatural or divine beings exercise limited influence on the mortal realm or only act under specific conditions. The Force and Wills in Star Wars, the Lion Turtles in the Avatar universe, and the Valar in Tolkien's Middle Earth series are all great examples. Gandalf's angelic divine powers were constrained by his mortal vessel, and he couldn't carry the Ring of Power to Mordor on Frodo's behalf. Beyond fiction, this is reflective of real-world myths and religious stories. These supernatural powers which be provide assistance, but they don't fight the battles for the mortal players because the hero's journey is more important than the destination. By this I mean it's important that the mortal players experience this journey for themselves. Luffy yelled at Usopp when he pried Rayleigh for information about the One Piece and threatened to quit the voyage on the spot, prompting a knowing smile to creep across the Elder Pirate's face because he recognized that this characteristic in part qualifies Luffy to someday succeed Roger as the next Pirate King. Rayleigh then advised Robin to wait and see through the voyage before learning the history of the world and the reason is that the voyage itself is transformative. Completing this voyage will inevitably shape their perspective on what they ultimately learn. You need to finish what you started. Why? Because a leader can't lead until he knows where he's going. Without the journey, without the struggle to attain knowledge or power, it may be taken for granted. By that I mean to say that moral fortitude is reinforced by grappling with difficult choices. The hero's journey isn't easy, it's incredibly difficult and dangerous. There's a very real risk of loss, injury, death, or even worse. But there's a greater risk in not taking the voyage, because the invaluable treasure earned can only be found on the road of adventure. Consider this. In biomechanics, there is a principle called Wolf's Law, which in essence states that bones remodel according to the mechanical load placed upon them. If bones sustain greater stress by carrying more weight, over time, they remodel proportionally, increasing in strength such that they can withstand greater loading. This is fairly intuitive. You lift weights to get stronger. You run to increase stamina. Dude, sucking at something is the first step towards being sorta of good at something. The spiritual world beyond the physical is ineffable, beyond human comprehension. The Book of Isaiah, part of the canon in both Jewish and Christian beliefs, states plainly that God's ways are not man's ways. Now I'm not saying the sea dragon in One Piece is a god, but I would surmise it exercises some type of spiritual or supernatural power. I should reiterate here that Oda does not map the characters in his story one to one on myths and folktales he draws on for inspiration, so though I keep referring to this dragon as Ryujin, it may go by a different name and exhibit different characteristics from the legend on which it's based. At this point, your guess is as good as mine what the restrictions might be on this proposed legendary sea dragon Ryujin in One Piece, but that doesn't mean his influence cannot be seen. The Grand Line can guide the world toward freedom, but it can't fight the battle directly. It can only equip the people of the One Piece world with the tools they need to liberate themselves. Indeed, we see that those handed unearned power often abuse it. Within the One Piece world, this is exemplified by these celestial dragons who presently hold the reins of power. Their position of absolute authority is passed down as a birthright, and they in turn believe themselves to be superior to their subjects. Conversely, Roger chose not to handpick his successor, and instead left fate to decide the person most fit to inherit his will and his treasure. The one who follows in Roger's footsteps needs to undertake the same voyage to become worthy of inheriting his mantle, and it isn't about the pride of being self-made. The fundamental transformation birthed by the journey is necessary to strengthen the future pirate king physically, mentally, and morally. This is the reason Rayleigh told the Straw Hats they need to see the world before learning the true history. They need to grow strong enough to survive the challenges on the road, but also must understand the true gravity of their actions. The Grand Line is the gift of the Sea Dragon, a globe-spanning stretch of ocean which is designed to protect freedom and raise up a hero or group of heroes capable of transforming the world for the better. The world has awaited a hero for centuries, if not millennia, with the night or darkness signifying the world's oppressors, the enemies of freedom. During this long dark night, the moon represents hope, as signified by Joy Boy's closest friends and allies around the world. 
The minks are powered up by the full moon. The clans of Wano all have names based on the moon. The fishmen dream of someday walking the path toward the sun. The giants celebrate the winter solstice to mark the death and rebirth of the sun. And those who carry the name D are considered enemies of these self-proclaimed false gods who presently hold power. Their name could reference the half moon hidden by the clouds as a symbol of fellowship and hope. It's important to understand what this symbolism signifies, because it tells us that despite his protests to the contrary, One Piece tells the story of Luffy's hero's journey, unifying it in structure with an untold number of mythic stories. The structure and themes of the story tell us that the journey itself through the Grand Line is necessary in raising up a champion of freedom. And we know that just like Luffy, his predecessor, former pirate king Gold Roger, once undertook the same voyage to the end of the sea. Yet Luffy and Roger are not the world's first warriors of liberation. When the story first began, we were led to believe that the treasure hidden on the final island, known to the world as the One Piece, was left behind by Roger. Yet as the stories progressed, we learned that those who seek the treasure at the end of the sea in the modern era are in fact following in the footsteps of a legendary figure erased from the pages of history known only as Joy Boy. His tales recorded along with the truth of the world's lost history, also safely protected on the final island alongside the One Piece. This naturally leads to the conclusion that the One Piece was instead left behind by Joy Boy, seemingly the last person to awaken the power of the mythic warrior of liberation, Sun God Nika. Yet the voyage Luffy and Roger undertook was necessary to shape them into the heroic figures the world needs. So couldn't the same be said for Joy Boy? Shouldn't he have also been forced to undertake this same voyage to become the Void Century's warrior of liberation? Perhaps he too once sailed toward the end of the sea. As noted, the Grand Line likely formed hundreds of years before Joy Boy's era began, and thus, there may already have been cause to sail toward the final island during Joy Boy's time. Accordingly, as I asserted in the previous video, I think it's possible that Joy Boy was in truth the world's first forgotten pirate king. And if indeed Joy Boy had the same relation to the sea as did Luffy and Roger, this might tell us something about the true nature of the One Piece itself. The best evidence that Joy Boy was a pirate in the same mold as Roger and Luffy can be found in the lyrics to the song Bank Saki, which as I have detailed in previous videos, in part tells the tale of Joy Boy's voyage. It describes a crew of pirates beset by tumultuous seas whose faith must be placed in the morning sun, a new dawn which will eventually rise. Joy Boy could have been a pirate, an adventurer, any number of things, but the mention of the Jolly Roger strongly indicates the flag of piracy indeed sailed from his mast. The song clearly describes a group of pirates and refers to proudly sailing the Jolly Roger, so if indeed this song describes Joy Boy, then he must have been a pirate. There's one more interesting detail to note. The song alludes to all sailing toward the end of the sea. Now this is interesting because in the current great age of pirates, Roger's words inspired the world to pursue the treasure One Piece. But in chapter 966, Roger indicated that the legend of the great treasure on the final island preceded him as this is what motivated his own circumnavigation of the globe. It's natural to assume Joy Boy is the one who left behind One Piece, but it's important to pay careful attention to Roger's exact words in chapter 967. While it's certainly possible Joy Boy is the one who placed One Piece at the end of the Grand Line, Roger doesn't outright confirm this. In this scene, the former Pirate King says, Oh Joy Boy, I wish I'd been born in your time. This is quite a treasure you've left behind. A tale full of laughs. So notice, Roger does say Joy Boy left behind quite a treasure, which could be referring to One Piece itself, but then he quickly follows that statement with the phrase, a tale full of laughs, which perhaps indicates Joy Boy's contribution to the great treasure was simply his story. That isn't to say the treasure itself is the story, but I'm suggesting One Piece may be older still than Joy Boy and something he too discovered like Roger. What remains unclear is why Joy Boy and many others would have been sailing toward the final island during the Void Century. Luffy is seeking Laugh Tale because of the legend of One Piece. Roger was seeking the final island because of an even older legend of a lost treasure. But what inspired Joy Boy? What was he hoping to find? It's possible that no such prompting was necessary. The allure of the unknown, the romance of adventure, and the promise of being the first in history to attain the unattainable could have been all that was required. Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune and glory. George Mallory, an English mountaineer who took part in the first three expeditions to Mount Everest, is famously quoted as having said when asked why he sought to climb the world's tallest mountain, because it's there. Odin, Roger, and Luffy all embarked with similar motivation, to discover what exists on the infinite horizon. This innate desire is what conducted them from their ordinary, familiar lives onto the fantastical road of adventure. But what truly qualifies them as heroes is that they recognized and responded to the call of destiny. 
The first leg of Odin's voyage with Whitebeard was carefree and aimless, but he later changed teams and sailed with Roger with a decided purpose. I don't think we can say anything for certain at this point, but based on the evidence, Joy Boy may have undertaken a voyage similar in nature to Roger and Luffy. We must ask whether he too was searching for something at the end of the sea. So could the treasure One Piece be as old as the Grand Line itself? Nothing yet refutes this possibility. Roger indicated the treasure Joy Boy left behind was his tail full of laughs, and thus it's possible One Piece was simply discovered by Joy Boy in similar fashion to Roger. If Joy Boy is indeed made from the same mold as Luffy and Roger, then perhaps he too was transformed by his voyage. After seeing and understanding the world and discovering the One Piece, he developed a vision for a world transformed which could only be realized by the King of Pirates. In truth, the mysteries surrounding the mythical fish fruit and its artificial duplicate have only deepened. Kaido proved unwilling to or incapable of awakening its power, and Guernica claimed that despite the incredible amount of resources that the world government poured into creating what is, to date, the only nearly perfect artificial devil fruit, it was fortunate Vegapunk's experiment was deemed a failure. And thus far, this sentiment is unexplained. The very fact that this mythical devil fruit was likely once hidden on God Valley already hints toward its incredible value, and it seems Guernica fears what that power's awakening could mean for the world government. The devil fruit, particularly zone fruit, have a will of their own. They bring to life people's wills or dreams, transforming the world around them. As Vegapunk stated, the name Nika can only be found in the very oldest manuscripts, and we know recorded history in the One Piece world dates back at least as far as 5,000 years. Meaning, mythic beings like Nika and the Sea Dragon, if they ever really lived, likely belong to the Age of Heaven, or Tenreki. Saint Shepard, one of the Five Elders, even referred to this struggle between the forces of freedom and oppression as an ancient battle, one likely rooted much farther back in the mists of time than the Void Century, further evidenced by the Lunarian's so-called Land of Gods, which predates Marijua and the world government, likely by hundreds or even thousands of years. They seem to take inspiration from the angels with flaming swords charged by God with guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden preventing Adam and Eve from returning to eat from the Tree of Life after being cast out for consuming fruit from the Tree of Knowledge. This nomenclature may indicate that the Lunarians once guarded the Eve Tree, perhaps the primordial source of all devil fruit. Thus, in the world of One Piece, the Lunarians may have also fallen from a position of divine protectors, watching over the land where once grew what are now known as the devil fruit. These stolen powers capable of transforming both those who consume the fruit and the worlds around them bring to life people's dreams and desires including the desire to take the form of legendary beings like Nika and the Sea Dragon, perhaps long departed from the mortal realm. Or maybe these entities never lived at all. Maybe they were only imagined or dreamed of by people, and those dreams have now come to life. In which case, it could be said that the Devil Fruit blurred lines between fact and fiction. After all, these legends have the very real power to reshape the material world as long as people believe in them. As Atlas told Luffy, the line dividing real and imaginary doesn't perfectly align with tangible and intangible. This pertains not only to the illusions of light created by Vegapunk, but also the separate dimensions of reality created by those who consume the devil fruit. Ultimately, I'm personally undecided on this particular point. Either possibility seems valid. The world's previous dating system, Tenreki, suggests that these beings like Nika and the mythic sea dragon could indeed have once lived in the Age of Heaven. Certainly, the One Piece world is home to all sorts of fantastical and mythical creatures. And we know for a fact that souls and an afterlife exist within this cosmology, so it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility that mythical or divine creatures lived in a now long forgotten age. Yet it's also possible that these particular mythical beings were simply used by people to characterize or describe aspects of the world around them, in which case Nika would be an embodiment of people's desire or dream to live a life of perfect freedom and the mythic sea dragon would be an embodiment of the sea's power to conduct the world towards said freedom. In either case, Luffy and Momo could then be viewed as mere shades or reflections of ancient mythical beings who have inherited their wills in the modern era. Fittingly, both have been described as key figures in delivering the world's new dawn. The power of the sea is a recurrent motif throughout the entire series. In fact, the very nomenclature of the world's dating system may suggest that the sea, or even more specifically, the sea circle, is presently regarded as the ruling or dominant force in the One Piece world. The red line, atop which resides the world's oppressors, and fittingly a symbol of the world's division and oppression, seems to be intentionally constructed for the specific purpose of oppressing the world's people. But the sea is the one thing which Emu and the world government have proven unable to conquer. Emu lives atop the Red Wall, as far as humanly possible from the sea, perhaps because he fears its power. 
After all, those who consume the devil fruit are cursed by the sea for their unnatural status. While this phenomena has yet to be fully explained, even with all of Vegapunk's knowledge, it seems that the devil fruit may have been created, or more probably stolen, by those who seek to oppress the world's freedom, and thus are cursed by the sea, a symbol of said freedom. It's no small coincidence that the Fishmen and Merfolk of Rigu Kingdom are the world's most oppressed people, not only because they're feared for their strength, but because they're most deeply connected to the sea itself, which the government in all its might has failed to conquer. And fitting with the thesis of this video, atop their castle and a place of reverence is the Sea Dragon, for whom their entire nation, Ryugu or Dragon Palace Kingdom, is named. The flag of piracy, the Jolly Roger, is sailed in opposition to these tyrannical forces. Even the Japanese word for pirate, kaizoku, means sea bandit or thief, containing the word sea. Oda crafted his story such that the pirate king represents the ultimate paragon of freedom. Luffy himself said he doesn't want to conquer the sea. He doesn't want to conquer or rule anything. He simply wants to live a life of perfect freedom, and by extension, protects the liberty of others. Just like the Red Line, the Sea Circle, or the Grand Line, for which the current epoch of history, Kaienreki, is named, also seems to be constructed for a purpose, to protect allies of the sea and guide the world toward freedom. It can only be traversed unidirectionally, meaning anyone who seeks the end of the sea must both possess incredible physical fortitude and be able to form bonds of fellowship with many people throughout their voyage. It's a gauntlet intentionally designed to select for the right person to inherit the treasure at the end of the sea. The Grand Line is hemmed in by the Comp Belts, inhabited by the Sea Kings, massive sentient creatures which take commands from the mermaid princess known as Poseidon, and they too await a day when the world will be restored. The Comp Belts can only be crossed using Sea Stone, a unique mineral found exclusively in the land of Wano, which resonates with the same energy as the sea itself. Wano is deeply connected to the sea, and just like Ryugu Kingdom, seems to revere this mythic dragon figure. In the distant past, its borders were open, and Sea Stone could be exported allowing all those who valued freedom to gather in the Grand Line, the Sea Circle, with the Comp Belts, like moats around a castle, keeping out the forces of oppression. Yet the most important function of the Grand Line seems to be in protecting the One Piece itself, a vast and very real treasure, which is the key to turning the entire world upside down. As Whitebeard foretold, discovery of the treasure will upend the entire structure of the world and trigger a global war the likes of which has never been seen in recorded history. Notably, the Sea Circle predates Joy Boy and the Forgotten Kingdom of the Void Century by approximately 600 years. The world's current dating system, the Age of the Sea Circle, began 1500 years ago. Which begs the question, if the Grand Line was designed to serve a purpose, protect the One Piece, and that purpose began hundreds of years before Joy Boy, then could it be possible that the One Piece is as old as the Grand Line itself? And if so, who created this legendary treasure of treasures? who originally placed it at the very end of the sea where only a select few can reach. As I asserted, the Grand Line could be characterized or even created by this mythic figure. So could the One Piece itself be the treasure of the mythic sea dragon? And if so, what could this tell us about its true nature and ultimate purpose? As discussed earlier in the video, the legendary sea dragon Watatsumi, or Ryujin, is said to have possessed the ability to control the tides and weather, the power of the sea itself. And there is no power in the One Piece world which Emu and the world government fear more than the power of the sea. So perhaps the sea itself, a mythic serpentine dragon, answers only to the one who discovers the One Piece, safely hidden at the end of the sea. Fittingly, the Pirate King, the hero the world demands, is the only person who doesn't want to control the sea, who doesn't want to control or conquer anything. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave a like. If you want to be notified when future videos are posted, please consider subscribing. It really helps this channel grow, and I really appreciate your support. But most important, make sure you let me know what you think down in the comments.